the final topic for adolescent medicine is the one that's near and dear to my heart, puberty. Um, Dr. James Tanner actually wrote this slide set out. He asked me merely to narrate it for him. So what is puberty? I know you guys have heard me talk about puberty and harp on puberty uh, because, you know, during the teen years, everything's about puberty. Every single issue that we discuss in adolescent health is all relegated on puberty. So what is puberty? It's interrelated changes that involve essentially every organ in the body. Uh, we think about the linear growth, uh, you know, the pubertal growth spurt, the changes in body composition, the profound changes in body composition. There's the maturation of the adrenal axis, which I think is an important part of what we know as puberty. There's the reactivation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, and you're saying, wait a minute, the reactivation of the HPG axis? Yes, because um, in the last trimester and the newborn, they have a fully functioning HPG axis that gets turned off sometime in the first six months of life. And one of the other aspects of puberty is this achievement of the ability to reproduce. So adolescence is a paradigm of chronologic age interacting with biologic change. So what are these changes associated with puberty? Write these definitions down because these are the correct definitions. If you see anybody that says anything that varies with this, they're just wrong. I'll tell you right now, they're just wrong. And you're saying, yeah, wow, this guy feels really full of himself. But let me tell you, these are the right definitions because what happens is that they confuse, for example, adrenarchy and pubarchy all the time. Adrenarchy is the activation of the adrenal cortex for the production of adrenal androgens. There are changes that undergo at the molecular level within the adrenal gland. With the conversion of cells that had been producing corticosteroids that are now going to be producing adrenal androgens. Pubarchy is the appearance of pubic hair. Pubarchy is not adrenarchy. Adrenarchy, adrenal androgens. Pubarchy, that's one of the effects of the adrenal androgens. It's the development of pubic hair. Thealarchy is the appearance of breast tissue often also relegated as the onset of puberty. Gonadarchy is the appearance of secondary sexual characteristics. And there's a second definition, the gonadal production of sex steroids. We published a paper a couple of years ago that have suggested that, especially among the obese girls who have palpable glandular breast tissue, that they do not have an increase in their gonadotropins early in puberty. And we propose that the reason that they're going through their growth spurt and that they have development of breast tissue is because of the conversion of adrenal androgens in the periphery into estrogens through the action of aromatase within the fat cell, within the adipocyte. Menarche is the age of the first menstrual period. And again, these are the changes, these are the definitions, the other things you need to think about are what we just went through. You know, changes in body composition, stimulation of growth plates, and the achievement of fertility. Let's talk a little bit about puberty in boys. So this is demonstrating pubic hair stages. These were the stages that were published by Marshall and Tanner, except actually it was Reynolds and Wines a couple years earlier than that who published this pubic hair staging system. Marshall and Tanner popularized it. And for those of you going into re academic research careers, you never want to team up with somebody who is really, really famous. The paper was by Marshall and Tanner, yet we've been calling them Tanner stages. So everybody said, oh yeah, Marshall worked with Tanner, but it was really Tanner's work. Okay. And actually, Dr. Tanner said, no, it's Reynolds and Wines. But they're, they're now calling sexual maturity rating system, so we're sort of getting out of the Tanner stages. Okay. Pubic hair stage one is no pubic hair. Pubic hair stage two is that there's a little bit of this fine downy hair along the base of the penis. In three, the hair is darker, coarser, curlier, and it begins to extend thinly over the middle of the pubic bone. In pubic hair four, the hair is adult in its characteristic, but has not gone from thigh to thigh yet. And in pubic hair five, 
it is adult hair that goes from thigh to thigh, and you begin to have this eustachian, uh, the male eustachian with this line sort of going up towards the belly button. Uh, those pictures also show you the changes that are occurring on in the rest of the body in these young men at the same time. The sequence of pubertal events in boys, the initial event in puberty in boys is an increase in testicular volume. It occurs at the same time that they hit their pubertal growth spurt. Six to 12 months after the, pubertal, uh, after the appearance of t increase in testicular volume, you see pubic hair being elaborated. And um, a, a year and a half or two after that is the peak of the height velocity. Six to 12 months after the peak height velocity is the appearance of sperm and urine and wet dreams slash nocturnal emissions. About a year after that, boys experience a strength spurt. If they're doing a grip strength, you can sort of document that. And it occurs around the same time as the attainment of pubic hair stage five, but there's still a little bit more of the pubertal growth spurt that occurs after that. So here's girls, same pubic hair staging system, and uh, there's also the breast staging system. Breast stage one is no breast tissue. They might have a little bit of fat, around the areola and papilla, but there's no palpable breast tissue. In breast stage two, it's a breast bud stage. When you feel the breast bud, you can feel sort of this somewhat firmer tissue that's um, in the adipose tissue, uh, and you can see an enlargement in the areola. In breast stage three, there's further enlargement of the breast tissue. Uh, there is no separation of contour of the areola from the breast. In breast stage four, the areola and the papilla are extended above the silhouette of the breast, um, a secondary mound above the rest of the breast. And in best breast stage five, there is regression of the areola, but the papilla is still extended. Some girls don't have breast stage four. They go from three to five, and some women never get past breast stage four. They, they never get to breast stage five. These are the sequence of events in girls. Um, and you can see this arrow here at the onset of puberty, breast stage two. But even a year, year and a half before this, you can see that the girls are in their pubertal growth spurt. The thing is you have to really be able to measure it precisely to know that they're entering this pubertal growth spurt. Um, and about, remember in our talks with, um, about gynecology, um, there's the peak height velocity and between breast stage two and menarche is about two to two and a half years. About a year and a half after menarche is the completion of puberty, which is the attainment of breast stage five and or pubic hair stage five, whichever is later, but there's still growth. There are textbooks that say that, you know, puberty ends at menarche. There's some textbooks that suggest that menarche is the start of puberty. Obviously, it can't be the start of puberty or the end of puberty, and in point of fact, it's not either. It's a you know, later uh, event in puberty, but it is not uh, the start or finish of puberty. And although this looks so much less complex than in um, boys, I have not included ovulation here, because ovulation is the full maturation of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, where you have a biphasic system. and so. This chart does not reflect uh, the full uh, part of this, uh, the full maturation of the hypothalamus and pituitary. Uh, this is a study looking at the pediatric research in office settings published in 1997 compared to the Breast Cancer and Environment Research Centers uh, published in 2012. And you can see that the age of onset of breast development uh, and this is actually in um, white and Hispanic girls, has gone down almost an entire year. Uh, and the earlier onset of puberty has been attributed to the increased BMI and probably also exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. Having stated that, Let's talk a little bit about uh, the onset of puberty in boys and its relationship to BMI. So this paper was published by Lee a few years ago, uh, looking at black and white adolescents. And what he commented on was that 
Um, higher BMI boys overall had an earlier onset of pubertal maturation. And if you include sort of skinny, thin, normal weight, overweight, and obese, and you looked at it sort of as uh, categorical with combining overweight and obese, you would find that the over, especially the overweight boys actually hit puberty a little bit earlier than the normal weight who hit it a little bit earlier than the thin boys. Um, but it's actually, if you take a look at it, it really is this much more complex situation where, you know, normal weight and overweight um, are different than the obese. The obese boys start probably producing, you know, a little bit of uh, that adipose mass may be converting some of the adrenal androgens into some chemical, some hormones that are feeding back on the hypothalamic pituitary axis and sort of turning it off, delaying it a little bit. So the relationship between BMI and onset and puberty in boys is a little bit more complex. Um, normal weight, mature before thin, overweight, mature before normal weight, and obese, mature after the um, overweight boys. Okay, so when you're taking a look at, you know, girls mature before boys and girls are more likely to have early maturation when contrasted to boys. Um, and when you're looking at it, the early maturing girls often do not have a secondary pathophysiologic mechanism for their earlier onset of uh, puberty. Boys are more likely to have later maturation and more likely, if they have later maturation, to also have no underlying pathophysiology. So the early maturing boy and the late developing girl needs to be evaluated. Um, the early maturing girl and the late developing boy should have a good history and physical examination, may not need to worry as much uh, about undergoing pathologic issues. Uh, and the best endocrine instrument that you have is the growth chart. The growth charts are indispensable because they'll sort of let you look at sort of how these changes are occurring uh, with tempo and with absolute timing. So when we're thinking about adolescence maturation, other things to think about is sort of how adolescents see the world and think about the world around them. There's a transition from concrete to formal operational thought. With formal operational thought comes abstract thinking, a sense of egocentrism, there's a sense of overthinking, and sometimes a apparent hypocrisy. Um, adolescents are also considered to be sort of hot-headed. But, you know, just for a moment, I want you to consider a really stressful event in the past three months in your life. I mean, really stressful. I want you to spend just a second thinking about that. Okay, at that moment, were you thinking of the greater good? Were you thinking about, oh yeah, I should totally let that guy who just slam, almost slammed into the side of my car when he ran a red light, which happened to me yesterday, I was probably not thinking about the greater good at that absolute moment. I probably can't say exactly what I was thinking here because it's taped and you, you might lose some of your respect for me, I don't know. So anyway, you were thinking with an adolescent brain at that moment when sort of your prefrontal cortex is overwhelmed by affect. That's thinking with an adolescent brain. It's hot cognition. There's earlier, cog earlier maturation of the nucleus accumens and locus ceruleus and later maturation of the prefrontal cortex. And so the mom and pop part of the brain that says, ah, 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 you shouldn't do that sort of doesn't mature before the reptilian part of the brain that says, hey, do it because it, you know, it feels good, doesn't it? So typically we've been thinking about this with adolescent development, um, that there is this socio-emotional incentive processing system that sort of dominates during the teen years until the cognitive control system, the prefrontal cortex sort of kicks in. In 2017, Romer um, took a look at a lot of different work and a lot of work that was coming out with the fMRIs and suggested that actually it looks like it's a little bit more complicated than that. 
and that what he proposed was sort of this three different systems, a family of curves, if you would. That the, the first dashed line is the adolescent engaging and exploring their environment of getting new sensations and new experiences, but it's about experience and exploration. And um, that around the same time and a little bit later maturing is this cognitive control which says, let me evaluate whether if I touch this hot stove, it'll burn. Let's see, when I touched it the last time it burned me, I'm not sure I need to test that again. Um, but every novel situation is sort of like, let me think about the risks and benefits of this. Eventually, rather than exploration and cognitive control, we sort of get the gist of it. Wisdom comes in. And see, since I'm the person with the highest number of years, I can say that I'm the wisest of all of us in this listening audience. Uh, but unfortunately, I've lost my sense of exploration. And crap, I've lost all my cognitive control, too. So I guess I should be wise. But it's getting the gist. What happens is yeah, you've been there before. You don't need to do this cognitive evaluation about whether or not you need to do it. Because, hey, you haven't touched the stove in years and years and years. And why should you start touching it now? So you don't even think about it. You sort of just go on from there and say, Let's get on. I'm just going to put this, the kettle on the back and uh, heat some water up for my tea. And that's it. Uh, good luck on your examinations. And just one little thing. Uh, once upon a time, I was the chair for the General Pediatric Certification Examination many, many years ago. This may be one of the reasons that there's a lot of questions on puberty that are still in the boards. I don't know. I don't talk to them about that. Anyway. Don't change an answer that you have on the board unless you are absolutely certain that you're changing it to the correct answer. You're more likely to change it to a wrong answer than you are to a correct answer unless you are certain that what you put on before was baloney and you got the real deal now. Thank you so much.